Good evening, people. First question I want to say is, what are you doing here in this weather? You should be outside in the park, enjoying yourself with a beer. Heaven help us, what, what are you thinking of? Uh, you know, Jay-Z's playing in Hyde Park, grab some beers and just go and sit outside and listen to it uh, a bit later afterwards, um, even if you don't get in. Right, okay, um, this, this session is on uh, blacklisting. Um, it's clearly one of the big things in the trade union movement at the moment uh, that sort of sprung up in, in the last couple of years. Um, this d discussion is going to be about what's been going on, but also about the different routes potentially to actually fight the blacklist and, and how we can actually overcome it uh, in, the, uh, uh, in the long term. Um, the people I've got uh, speaking uh, with me, to introduce myself, my name's my name's Dave Smith, I'm the secretary of the uh, Blacklist Support Group uh, and I'm a blacklisted worker myself um, and my case is uh, currently at the uh, EAT and I'm part of a high court uh, legal case uh, that's, uh, that's coming up uh, as well. Uh, if anyone saw the, uh, um, as my kids tell me, if anyone saw the Panorama programme on Blacklist Britain uh, a couple of weeks ago, I was the one in a hat shouting at people a lot, uh, <laughs> apparently. Uh, that's what my kids are telling me. Um, in, the, in the speakers on the platform we've got David Renton, who's, the bar who's a barrister from Garden Court Chambers. He's been the leading barrister on the blacklisting uh, cases. Um, he's taken uh, the case against Carillion, uh, which is the case that exposed all the stuff about the police involvement. Um, he's also the, uh, bar the barrister who's been working with Frank Morris uh, on Crossrail, taking the case against Crossrail, which is currently uh, sort of parked in the High Court at the moment. So he's, he's, he's the barrister who's actually got two uh, LOEV uh, blacklisting claims going through the uh, British legal system at the moment and Dave's going to be talking about uh, the, the various different legal challenges uh, to blacklist that comes on. Uh, we've also got Phil Chamberlain <coughs> at the end. Phil Chamberlain's a freelance investigative journalist who was Phil's story originally in The Guardian um, before, while everyone was just talking about this as a rumour, Phil wrote the story in The Guardian and the, uh, the officers in the Information Commissioner's office physically read his story and it was his story that ended up leading to the raid on the, uh, in, on the blacklist in the first place. So if it hadn't been for Phil's story in The Guardian, they wouldn't have, we wouldn't even know that the blacklist still existed uh, to this day. <laughs> And following on from the point I said about, you know, it, it was Dave's work in the uh, employment tribunal that exposed all the stuff about the police. Phil's at the moment doing investigative work uh, linking in a lot of these undercover cops that <coughs> people probably have seen on the uh, dispatches programme and on the telly. Phil's doing a lot of investigative work at the moment. Uh, 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 on, on the undercover police and, <coughs> and I'm sure that's the main part that he's going to be uh, talking about. I do have some apologies and I genuinely, some genuine apologies. Um, Michael Meijer was meant to be speaking here today um, and literally uh, on uh, Tuesday this week he said he's, he's been double booked uh, because he didn't realise it was 7 o'clock in the evening he's, he's double booked somewhere else. So apologies Michael Meijer sends his apologies and he's genuinely quite uh, annoyed about the fact that he couldn't come here and Frank Morris is meant to be here, but he's been in Durham all day at the Durham Miners Gala. So he's allegedly coming down here on a train uh, to make the meeting. Uh, but if, in all honesty, if I had money on it in, in today's weather up in, up in Durham at the Miners Gala, I, I think if he turns up, it'll be a miracle. You know, so, you know, I'll, I'll be honest with you. you know, so, so that's the truth. Um, rather, very often we have like three or four blacklisted workers who tell the story. Uh, uh, of what we're doing, but, but rather than do that, there is a brand new uh, campaign video that we've been that's been produced for us by the man standing over at the back, Sean Day, uh, who, uh, who, were, who who is one of the people who works for the Real News Indie Media Collective. Um, he's been selling DVDs outside, and he's actually doing a show later on this evening after this, starting at nine o'clock. And and Sean's really been an integral part of the the campaign against the blacklisting with all of the videos. If anyone's seen any of the videos on Crossrail or anything like that on, on the internet, then it's basically Sean that's made them. And generally, I think round of applause for them. And, and 
so rather than me uh, do my bit, we're going to show a video which gives people an update to it and then we'll get on with the speakers afterwards. So, turn off the lights and here we go. Oh, your cousins. I was a point poetic
to three and two. But what a lucky fans. We're here now. Asking for justice. Jesse got a terrible time. The game in the central line is well the cocktails and they made it all over the cops. It's actually interrupted him with the Yes. He never went after he came out of jail. He was a bloody shell. He was finished. He destroyed him. And I'll never forget the comments of that like that.
for hacking somebody's phone. But in the case of blacklisting, not only is there no criminal penalty, there is no imprisonment and there is no sanction. The long term we've just found out that um, loads of environmental activists, as well as construction workers, uh, are on these blacklists. I mean, our uh, Broadway campaign, one of our key coordinators tried to go to America a few months ago, John Stewart, wasn't allowed in the country. Wasn't allowed in the country, not because he was committed any crime or anything like that, but we now discover he was on the blacklist. In 1990, I was sued by the Gold Corporation over a relief that, that criticised their business practices around um, promotional unhealthy food and exploitation of workers and being anti trade unions uh, and environmental damage. Um, and it turned into the longest case in English legal history. During the trial, it emerged that McDonald's had got information from the Economic League and from Special Branch, including people's personal details and home addresses, um, and in some cases, false information was passed on. So it also emerged that McDonald's had had uh, seven private investigators infiltrating our groups during the course of our meetings that had like, I don't know, between 10 and 20 people. The Information Commissioner knew the names. The Information Commission actually had the National Insurance Numbers, actually, for virtually everybody on that list. And yet, they've not taken a single step to actually contact the people and say, you're going to There are individuals uh, that have been told by the ICO that they have their real file, when in fact the ICO are in possession of a full file related to them. Only 5 to 10 percent of the material which was found in the Joint Wedge Office in 2009 was removed. They seized a computer from the internet. They never ever analyzed it. But they did worse than that. They gave it back to them. The next union collusion, and the next spot I want to still be paid by the union, the civilian. The man in the shirt, they want to come on a bit more than a place. How did he tell it? It was very difficult. And we knew that it could not be operated the blackness of success from the third the collaboration of some cool tech trade union. We knew that. I want to make an apology. That's an apology for the way that you have been betrayed by the state, by the courts, by the information commissioner's office, by the political parties, all of them, by the police <coughs> and by the media. All of them, all of the institutions of our state have utterly failed it. And I am utterly ashamed to be part of the state which has allowed this to happen.
And once again, round of applause for Sean for putting it together. Um, okay, um, you can see why we showed out rather than having, you know, lots, lots of blacklisted workers speaking. It gets the message over better, I think, and, you know, and it's 2013, let's use the technology. Um, right, I'm going to, the, the first person I'm going to ask to speak is, is Phil. Um, as I said before, he's the Guardian journalist, investigative journalist who originally broke the story. He's doing some stuff in, at the moment on uh, uh, the undercover uh, police. So, Phil, take it away, it's all yours. So, Thank you uh, for the um, I'm going to talk briefly about how the story broke, uh, about what I expected to find and what we know now and what, what may be coming up next as well. This is a story, story about luck to some extent, as, um, as most uh, <coughs> stories turn out to be about, about luck. <coughs> what, um, in 2008, I pitched a story to The Guardian about blacklisting of, of trade union activists and we know that wherever workers organise themselves, represent their interests, that state corporations will use tools, blacklisting, infiltration, to undermine that. So we expect to see some of that, but proving it is, a, is another matter. Probably the easy example prior to this was the Economic League formed uh, just after the First World War, uh, which really came across in the mid-80s as um, through uh, ineptitude and, and also the work of a number of reporters. Its activities are exposed and its lists, tens of thousands of names, spurious details, uh, which were handed out to uh, organisations which subscribed to its services were, were exposed uh, and the organisation died off in the kind of early 19, 1990s. And there was a long suspicion that there was a kind of bastard child with economic leave existed somewhere, but the idea to be able to kind of find those same kind of information was thought to be unlikely, but they were interested in the story. Now you are talked to the um, Talked to the government at the time, of course, it wasn't a, wasn't a problem. You know, they'd asked the uh, they'd asked they'd gone to the best source possible to see if blacklisting existed. They'd gone to the construction firms and said, uh, "Do you blacklist?" And the construction firm said, "No, no, we, we obviously don't." And that was good enough in uh, in 1997. And they'd gone to the construction firms directly and said, uh, "You know, you, you sure you've kind of got the procedure in place?" No, no, absolutely fine. And that was that was good enough for the government. Uh, indeed, when I spoke to the uh, unions about it, they were quite uh, quite convinced, but again, evidence. But UCAP were quite positive because at least they said, when I spoke to them, that we've got regulations in place which prohibit blacklisting. They didn't actually know that when the Employment Regulations Act came in 1997, the specific instrument which would have prohibited blacklisting had been withheld, again, because the government went out to consultation and said to the industry, do, you, do we really need this? And that, no, we, we don't actually need that. So there's kind of a level of uh, acceptance, if you like, that it went on, but a feeling that it was something we kind of had to live with was there. We weren't maybe able to get the same level of details we'd had from the economic league. But it was clear that story after story, Steve Aitchison was one of the people I spoke to, suggested that there was uh, more than just uh, accidental uh, people having the same kind of story. There were too many tales of people who had long uh, and uh, uh, very skilled uh, careers and yet were unable to find work. There were too many tales of people around the country who, having raised health and safety issues, suddenly found themselves not required anymore. There were too many stories about people who had uh, otherwise sit so perhaps some very little political activity, suddenly finding uh, that they were taken on in one day, a phone call was made and not required anymore. And indeed, quite explicitly in the oil industry, uh, it was run fairly, fairly openly. Uh, the article was written in uh, 2008. There was actually some evidence like, uh, that did come to light when I went through it in detail. There was an employment tribunal held, I think it was in, uh, in East Anglia, uh, again with Steve Aitchison involving a dispute that had taken place in Manchester. And the tribunal had actually explicitly said in its finding that blacklisting existed. <clears throat> so not covered in a public forum. This is about the, the state operating to uh, make sure that people have uh, uh, proper recompense for if they've been uh, uh, mistreated. And in this official forum, the employment tribunal said yes, that listing actually existed, partly based on the evidence of a whistleblower called Adam Rainwright, who had his own reasons for wanting to get his back on uh, on the industry. And he said that you know he could prove it take place. Indeed. He told the government several years previously and had a meeting with the civil servant to give exactly that kind of information. <clears throat> so there was a pattern, if you like, of misbehaviour, even if we couldn't identify a policy. The story gets published on a Saturday, and this is where the luck comes in, because there was a, a worker for the Information Commissioner's Office read, uh, read the paper, and uh, on the Monday morning she drops it on the desk, and Dave Clancy was uh, an investiga investigative, uh, investigator for the Information Commissioner's Office, uh, ex um, police officer from Great Manchester Force, 
and saying, I think there's something here that we should be looking at. You're, we're the organisation, we're the state uh, agency which is required to make sure that people's personal data is treated correctly. We seem to have a, a prima facie case here worth investigating, and, uh, and it was taken on. And over a year, Clancy, who had uh, access to a lot more uh, legal powers than uh, any journalist, was able to trace a link from uh, a particular corporation, Hayden Young, through to a similar nominally looking door in the West Midlands, uh, the famous kind of green door, which was the home of the Consulting Association, and in March of that year, having obtained a warrant, the first time the ICO had used its powers uh, in that way to obtain a particular warrant, previously uh, they'd never made use of the particular powers, they uh, wanted to keep the door in, but it was opened up for them. And they went in, and as Dave uh, Clancy describes me, it was Christmas. Now, subsequently, we may have hoped that they could have taken more of the presents away with them and not left so many under the tree. But nonetheless, 3,200 files were taken away, and they've proved a gold mine in terms of exposing the, uh, the dirty secrets at the heart of the collusion between state and the construction industry. And the names that they're on there weren't just construction workers. Academics, uh, lawyers, uh, journalists, and indeed environmental activists as well, names were on those lists. And by examining the detail that we're taking apart the detail on those lists, we've been able to establish quite a lot about how uh, corporations worked, who they liaised with, how the information was covered. And part of that that we're exposing now is being able to chart the links between uh, the use of surveillance and undercover police officers feeding information into this uh, intelligence gathering system. There's information on those files which could only have come from police officers. There is uh, information on the environment, environmental activists directly linked with undercover officers that have been exposed already. Uh, there is no reason that some information would have become there other than that the, uh, the state decided they needed to target these people and that the, this bastard child economically incurs consulting association was providing a useful off the shelf, deniable, and funded by the industry, set up with a £10,000 donation from Sir Robert McAlpine to be able to kind of act as, a, as another intelligence gathering system to exchange information. Indeed, it looks like uncover officers were directly asked to look at the work of construction uh, activists and environmental activists and others that may be causing problems. Indeed, Charles Wilson, an academic up at um, up in Aberdeen, uh, whose book on the Piper Alpha disaster is now required reading by Shell, was on the list to be looked at for, uh, because his, uh, his work was causing problems for the oil industry. And we're starting to be able to piece together a picture of that collusion. It's a picture actually that we put together not as much by journalists, but actually by activists themselves who put the jigsaw pieces and be able to demonstrate the evidence, be able to put faces, be able to put times and places that we've been able to geographically work out where people are. This is a story about luck, it's a story about some journalists just not willing to give it up. More importantly, it's a story about those who were victimised by the blacklist, refusing to become victims, but actually take it on throw it back in the face, and now we have the names of those people operating not just within the construction industry at the very top, Callum McAlpine, um, who uh, set up the uh, association, uh, but also the names of the human relations managers, those people that actually on a day-to-day -day basis uh, allowed this operation to take place. We have the names of people, uh, police officers who were spying, and we started to turn the, uh, the, the uh, spotlight back on them. I don't think actually that uh, this is a story of uh, of uh, doom and gloom. This is a story about people taking the taking it back on themselves and refusing to be uh, cast as uh, as uh, the victims of this, but actually taking on and showing that uh, sunlight the best disinfectant, shining a spotlight on these activities. And I do think we're going to see over the next six to twelve months further uh, exposure of some of these, and the names of the guilty parties quite rightly uh, called to account. Uh, the state, in so many ways, has failed in all the various forms to be able to fulfill its proper function. Finally, uh, MPs are, are looking at it and doing a, uh, doing a, uh, a good job. Finally, uh, we're uh, uh, being able to uh, see some more uh, interest from the media. I think that uh, the legal system, and Dave can talk much more eloquently and knowledgeably than I can, has been uh, uh, fairly cataclysmically rubbish in this, in this respect, but actually not being able to accept that and take it on and not take it over an answer. So despite their kind of best efforts, actually they will be seen in court and they will be seen in the court of public opinion and they will be named and they will be shamed. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Phil. Uh, and uh, with, with, as, as Phil said, there's a number of legal cases going on at the moment, as it said on the... Uh, as he said on the uh, campaign video, 
there's cases going to the High Court, there's various employment tribunals uh, and human rights uh, cases being gathered together uh, and probably the, uh, the barrister has done more work on uh, blacklisting than, than anyone else in the country uh, is David Renton and uh, please say hello David Renton. <laughs> So I'm, I'm not going to speak for long. People can hear from my voice. I've been in Marxism for a couple of days now. And my throat's completely cold, so I've only got about five minutes, I reckon, to, that I'll go speak for it if I want to speak for longer. But, but I, want to, I do want to talk about two of the cases. Important. I know, I know just to follow on before I come on to it, it is worth acknowledging, just as Dave said, there are not only two cases here. There are still several cases working through the system. Um, you heard, I think, one person earlier talked about um, one high court case. It's not one high court case. There's a main High Court case, which has been um, put in by a firm called Gunny Clark Ryan, the one of the um, one of the lawyers from that was one of the um, speaking heads in the video. But because of that case, and because it looks like it's got legs, um, the other trade unions whose, me uh, whose members aren't yet associated with that case, particularly Unite, particularly GMB, are talking about launching High Court claims of their own. So three High Court claims. There's a complaint to the Independent Police Complaints Commission about the use of undercover police. That's ongoing. And of course, um, again, it's not really come up so far today, but it's, um, for us it's an incredibly important source of the evidence. There's the subcommittee of the House of Commons that deals with the Scottish Affairs subcommittee that's um, had in a whole number of the witnesses. Um, Ian Kerr gave testimony there. He generated, he produced all of the documents which enable us to show, you know, for example, um, that eight of the um, major multinational companies were still in 2009, 2010 chipping in more than £10,000 a year each into the coffers of the blacklisting through a consulting association. And personally, whenever I see um, the solicitors who represent any of the major unions, I always start any conversation I have with a simple question, and at some point someone's going to give me the answer, which is, given that these eight companies are still trading, why haven't you started private prosecution against them? And when's it going to start? And I'll tell you, at some point it is going to start. At some point we're going to see lines, we're going to see gears. So not just being sued by workers, but in the criminal courts for the part that they played in blacklist. It hasn't happened yet, but it will happen. Now, the two cases that I've been involved in are Dave's case and Frank's Morris, Frank Morris's case. And I just want to say a bit um, about each of them, where they're at legally, and why... Um, and in a sense where that connects, I think, some of the themes of this event, which is, in lots of ways, is how do we organise in a world where, you know, our side's been losing for some period of time, some things have changed, some things have got harder, but also there are some new opportunities. I'm not suggesting for a second that the answer to those opportunities generally is litigation. Anyone who thought that would need their head is in some of them. But there are some things about blacklisting in particular, which at least make it a place where we can fight on a bit more than an even terrain than it is normally, and I'll try and explain what those are. So the details first of Dave's case and then of Frank's case. Dave's case, um, and the first thing to convey is this is ridiculous. Dave's case was put in in 2009, and we still don't have a decision in it four years later. We have a decision, which is that there's been a final hearing at the Employment Tribunal, which found that Dave um, found against Dave. Um, but you, having said that, um, you'd be hard pressed to find a better basis on which to lose. Because what the tribunal found was that Dave um, um, had been, um, the, his consult the entries on the Consulting Association had actually been put there by his employer. They found that the reason the employer did that was to do him damage, either as a health and safety rep or as a trade unionist, it didn't really matter which, either of them are unlawful discriminatory reasons. And it found that the employer, by putting that information on his file, caused him damage. And I suspect at this point everyone in the room is thinking, well, if, you found all, if they found all of those things, how on earth did he manage to lose? And the answer for those, um, and as I look around, I know there are a lot of people in this room who have been very heavily involved in the blacklisting in actually far more than I have in the local area. So many of the people know this story, but there's some people who don't. For those of you who don't know the story, the reason why Dave lost at first tier, lost at the first level of the tribunal, is very simply this. Dave was employed in the key contracts through an agency. In our law, in general, where you're employed through an agency, that means that the company that you're actually working on, the one that controls the site, 
the ones that set your day-to-day -day duties, isn't your employer. That's the general rule. And what the tribunal found is because the um, company, in his case, Carillion, that had added this information to him, wasn't his employer. In the employment tribunal, which is a court to bring claims against the employers, your employer, he couldn't succeed as a matter of law because of that, simply because of that company in between the agency. Now, what's fun about this as a lawyer is that in our legal system, it brings together different sorts of rights. Some of them are domestic, some of them are employment, some of them are this, that. And the higher up you go, the system doesn't really matter anymore. Where, what the legal source of those rights are, they get adjudicated together ultimately. And the basic point says, um, in European human rights law, in the UK still, just about, despite the best interests of the uh, coalition and their best desire, we are still subject to the Human Rights Act, the European Convention of Human Rights, etc. In there, we have certain rights. Article 8, effectively the right to privacy. Article 11, the right to associate, which means the right to join a union, not to be penalised for joining a union. Those rights apply, as everything else does in the Convention, to everybody. Not just to employees, not just to workers, but to everybody. And so the higher up that goes in the system, the harder and harder it is to justify the original decision of the first tribunal, which is that they can't be entitled to those rights because it will now he may have been a worker, an agency worker, he wasn't an employee. The higher up goes in the system, the more the legal answer becomes, no, it's absolutely blindingly obvious. Everyone's entitled to those rights, and therefore Dave's entitled to those rights. And therefore there is, um, as you know, the higher up you go, it's the opposite of mountaineering. <laughs> the higher up you go, the easier it becomes to breathe. And the more obvious it becomes that the right answer in law must be that he's going to have to win the case. Now, that will be interesting. And it'll be interesting not just to him, um, in his case, obviously, we want him to win. But it'll be interesting for far wider sets of workers because one of the funny things about the, the Human Rights Act and the Convention is they've never been that important in employment law because generally, the sorts of rights you're talking about, things like the right to privacy. The, the people who've relied on them in court are generally people who've got something to hide. You know, your employers hacked your email account, and on hacking your email account, they found you did massive fraud against the company. So you say, you're not entitled to go into my emails, or, or whatever, or, you know, um, the guy who went to swingers clubs um, and, and paid on the, work, you know, on the work credit card, I don't want you to know that I did that. Well, I do know that you did it. And the courts generally haven't liked that. They haven't liked people using privacy and the, the rights in the convention, as it were, as a shield to hide their misbehaviour. But never until blacklist has come around and we had cases in the system where people have been using the employment context, those rights as a sword to say, wait a second, whose rights have been unambiguously infringed? It's the rights of the workers. Who's infringing those rights unambiguously? It's the employers. Suddenly, that makes everything more interesting. And it, it does mean that some of those concepts are up for grabs, like employer and like worker. I'll come back. Again, once I've talked a bit about Frank's, just say a bit more about why that's so important. Now, come on now to Frank, and again, Frank was in the film. Um, he was the one with the rather, rather nice sweater, actually, if you looked at the footage of the AGM from earlier this year. Um, Frank's case is, is about something, again, very simple and straightforward. At the end of the last year, um, he was sacked, but it wasn't just you know, someone sent Frank um, a dismissal letter simply. Um, the situation was he was employed again. It's, it's sort of three. It's two companies, one worker. It's not an agency now. He's, he's employed through a subcontractor, and the subcontractor was relatively sympathetic. And the the employer rang up the subcontractor after they take him and said, "What on earth are you doing taking on this mad lunatic trade unionist?" And it's just worth saying to give a sense of what a mad lunatic trade unionist Frank is. As far as I can tell, he's been a trade unionist for more than ten years. Had never been a rep once in his life. And have been involved in just two disputes. Each time is a relatively minor figure. If, if that's enough to be able to say that person should never work in the industry or any industry again, that gives you an idea of what sick business blacklisting is, doesn't it? But Frank, when Frank's, um, when the contractor, the big company, the multinational, turned around to the little company, the subcontractor, and said, get rid of him, he's a trade genius, and they didn't. What the, what, the, what the main contractor then did is they turned around in effect to the subcontractor and terminated his contract a year early, resulting in around 20, I think it's 22, 23 workers all losing their jobs. And, and we've been, again, that's been going to the tribunal ever since. Um, 
It's different from Dave's case. Dave's case relates to blacklisting from early in the 90s. Before these regulations you heard a bit about came in, which was supposed to make blacklisting illegal. The regulations came in 2009. So this really is the first case that tests what happens when New Labour makes law. <laughs> was it any good? And the first thing we learn is that, again, Frank can't be the employee of the major multinational company because he's the employee of the subcontractor. Um, again, in general, you can't bring a claim um, in the employment tribunal against the third party. The regulations, thankfully, say to some extent you can. But lo and behold, one of the circumstances where you can't is where the subcontractor has been put out of business. You, you almost do wonder sometimes if they haven't got one of these sort of nasty little um, city lawyers to read through the regulations in advance. But what are we going to do? It's going to make life difficult as possible for anyone to ever actually get us in the courts. But again, there is a mechanism. We're applying to the High Court for permission, and it'll be interesting to see. Um, where it comes. Again, for Ferris, I'm not going to go into the detail of it because there's certainly too specific to the cases. But again, for the next stage, can we get it back before the tribunal? I'm actually relatively optimistic. Um, I, I think we probably will, and I think the case will probably be over realistically, probably in autumn and winter. I don't think it's going to go away. Um, I do wonder how on earth Frank would have survived. I mean, it's already been 40 hearings. You know, he's going to have to apply to the High Court for mission. Da, 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 if he hadn't had the full non equivocal backing of the National Trade Union. Um, yes, three cheers for United for doing it in this case. But my God, why haven't the unions been operating that level of support to absolutely everybody? And as you saw in the film, let's be absolutely clear a whole bunch of these workers are on the blacklist because of shady little bits of gossipy information that's being traded. traded between trade union officials and personnel managers. And when you do start reading through the files, that's obvious. What these cases are both about for me, really, 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 what they're both about is this mechanism by which employers try to get out of all their legal responsibilities by shoving between them and the workers just one other company, whether it's an agency, whether it's a subcontractor, say, so once we've done that, that's it. All our legal liabilities have gone. And the point I want to convey is that this isn't just something that happens to blacklisted workers, it's not just something that happens in construction. Although construction is at the sharp end of it, it's something that's becoming more and more common. Um, if you look at the ONS, the Office of National Statistics, their, uh, their figures for workers in Britain, how many people in Britain, or percentage of all workers, are on full time permanent contracts, not agency work, and not self employed? According to them, on my reading, the figure is down to 55%. Um, and just one of those, probably the most important one, self-employment. Amongst all workers in London, self-employment rates are currently 18%. You know, these aren't just <coughs> building workers. This is a strategy, it's one of the main strategies for the capitalist class in the age of neoliberalism to try and deprive workers of their rights. And that's, so in the ultimate sentence, that doesn't mean, and therefore the most important thing is you need to get some narky barrister who isn't going to give up, or whatever nonsense like that. What that shows is the absolutely extraordinary, sterling work that's being done by the Blacklist Support Group, including every single comrade in the room who's been involved in the Blacklist Support Group, and I see at least three of you. People in that campaign, those 350 demos, they're not just fighting against the blacklist. They're not just fighting to democratise the construction industry, but they're actually fighting against one of the main parts of the boss's offensive against all of us. Um, look, I'm going to open it up to, to questions. Uh, there's a couple of points that was made. Uh, Phil, Phil made a point about not being a victim, and I think that's very, very true. Look, I've got a blacklist file. My blacklist file is 36 pages long. It tells you about you know, every time I've been a union rep, it's got my safety rep's credentials photocopied in it. Um, it's got stuff about my wife in it. It's got stuff about my brother in it. It's got what car I drive, my mobile phone number, when I moved house, it's got the change of address. Yes, we could, you know, to be honest, we've all got them. There's people with files, one of the fellas on there, uh, you saw Brian Higgins, um, he's, he's got a file that's 49 pages long, covered him for, for nearly 40 years they followed him around various different building sites, wherever he tried to uh, uh, organise on building sites. But in all honesty, this isn't about me, this isn't about Brian Higgins, this isn't about Frank Morris, this isn't about Steve Aitchison, this is about Labour 
versus capital. You know, this is a dispute between big business and workers, and this is just how it works. You know, there's no point crying about it. We're on the left. We've always thought this is how it happened. All we've done is we now know the mechanism, and we are going to abuse these people until we get justice. You know, this this session is called "How Do We Break the Blacklist," and I think there's a variety. You know, people have put on either the video or what Dave or what Phil has done is there's various different options. There's the legal option, the legal route, where we can go to the High Court, we can go to employment tribunals, we can go to the European Court of Human Rights. That's one method. We can go to the political route because the Parliamentary Select Committee have done an investigation on it. John Cruddus, the person who's drawing up the Labour Party election manifesto, is writing stuff about blacklisting in the Labour Party election manifesto. So potentially there might be something that happens uh, uh, in, in Parliament. Um, but really, I think this is about us. It's a, you know, we shouldn't rely on lawyers, we shouldn't rely on parliamentarians, we should rely on our own strength as trade unionists and of workers. And if we're going to defeat this, we'll defeat it industrially. That's the point. And it's about how we campaign, how we work, and how we get workers to come out uh, and support us industrially. And I also say, there are people in this room who've been out at six o'clock in the morning on picket lines with me, uh, who've turned up and shut down Oxford Street. God knows how many times we have to shut down Oxford Street before one of us was arrested because we must have shut it down 20 times uh, in, in, in the last 12 months. That's the debate I want to have. Uh, the debate I want to have isn't about how bad things are, but about how we're going to change it and what the uh, where, what the strategy is to get this over and done with. So, any questions? Get brother there. Yeah, by all yeah, means. Yeah. 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 My name's Brian Parkin. I'm a member of the Socialist Workers' Party of Leeds. Yeah. Sorry. Sorry. Yeah. I'm Brian Parkey, I'm a member of the Socialist Works of Parts of New Leeds. I'm a research fellow at the university and my background is energy. And Pete Shaw at the back there has been causing a good deal of trouble for the past uh, God knows how long. Uh, put me onto the, put me onto the uh, rank of our construction workers because I was looking at the, the, uh, the uh, regeneration required for the power generation sector. And uh, uh, that was my initial introduction to the uh, file organisation. But then Crossrail came up, um, and I started to do some research on these companies. It's quite clear right from the beginning that the that this 16 billion pound contract or group of contracts is actually being divided up in, by a number of, of what are called first tier contractors who are consortia. And these consortia effectively operate as a cartel. And they operate as a cartel under the direction of the Crossrail Company. So the Crossrail Company is, is a, joint, a, a joint venture body under the direction of the Lord Mayor of London, Boris Johnson. And it was the model for Crossrail is a, it is a replication of the Olympic project, which is a non-union project. That was the intention right from the beginning. And it was the intention clearly from the beginning that, that the companies were going to try to keep the unions out. Um, the context of this is, I'll be very, very brief, the context of this is that the construction industry is an acute crisis, and that crisis is actually being put onto the backs of the workforce, to the extent that in 1980 there were four Sorry, five fatalities in the construction industry in that year recorded. Last year, there were 50 fatalities. Fatalities are now running at one per week. Frank Morris was, uh, was elect an elected safety representative. There were accidents occurring on the crossroad which were being swept under the carpet. Frank Morris was a barrier between that level of exploitation and the workers' safety. That's why he was victimised. The other thing about, um, about, and I'll be very brief here to conclude, is that the, the, the importance of this case is that it, it, it is, whilst it flushes out the blackmailing conspiracy at this, at this level, uh, and I'm sure Dave Renson and his legal team will, will get to the details of this um, for public disclosure, is that whilst Whilst the, whilst the big companies might be doing a mere culpa and saying that this is a historical record, what's happening in the construction industry now is a, is a wave of subcontracting. Direct employment on books is a thing of the past. What is happening now is that the main companies 
with a small number of core employees might not be blacklisting, but they are subcontracting this, the blacklisting responsibilities to subcontracting companies. And just an illustration of this, the guy there called, called Colin, his name isn't Colin, he's a scouser, I know him, by, his name was Paul, he worked at Fiddler's Ferry Power Station, he was victimised there, he had to move to Hull, he lost his home and everything, he's been on blacklist, He's, he's now working on a payroll payroll company at Drax Power Session under a third name now. That is how appalling this, this whole systemic uh, racket is going on. And this is, a, this is a skilled electrician. There are welders I know, there are, there are, there are the skilled workers I know, who, who, whose lives have been, been rendered hell because of this. And really, all, all tribute to the to the unions for starting this, but it won't go away. And I think that it, the, the price of safety, the price of decent union representation, decent wages, terms and conditions, the price of that is eternal vigilance. This is class war at its worst, and we've got to win it. Thank you. You can either talk loud or come to the front. Okay, right. Okay, sorry, it's tight, so come to the front. Yeah, sorry. My name's Pete Shaw. I'm a blacklisted uh, construction worker and electrician. And not only that, I don't want to talk about my blacklisting. It, it, you know, the, the more important thing to talk about is, is how we're going to beat it. And I've been involved with Dave. And I'm also a member of the National Rank and File uh, Construction Committee, which we meet on, on a regular basis, and we were successful in winning the Besner dispute about two and a half years ago. Since that dispute, we have specifically fought against the blacklist, and I'm proud to say that our national union has now taken this on board. I myself have been uh, adopted by the national union working in uh, Yorkshire Numberside and I have attended uh, in eight weeks 200 demonstrations against blacklisting and against BAM, Farovil and Keir, the blacklisters, with the, uh, the actual objective of their blacklisting us will blacklist them. And just a little story, one of the demonstrations, we put a demonstration outside Sheffield Town Hall and demanded that Sheffield as a major um, employer or giving contracts to companies like BAM for Oville and Keir, end that process. And if they didn't end that process, we would never give up these demonstrations against the, the council. We would oppose the council, we would stand candidates against them if necessary. And eventually, they allowed us to, to, to go and meet the council. And I spoke to a full council meeting and gave them the access to myself as, as, as a blacklisted worker and what it meant to me. And that council that day voted that they would uh, demand that uh, Nick Clegg, who we all know from Sheffield MP, would, would have to raise this in Parliament and that the uh, Sheffield Council would organise a meeting be between BAM, uh, Froville and Keir, because all three companies don't work in Sheffield, and if, if the Unite the Union could present the evidence, which we have the evidence, that they were still involved in blacklisting, then they would renege on all their contracts and they would lose all their contracts. This is the way forward by blacklisting the blacklisters, showing these people that they can't wreck our lives. For years, I've, 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 I've wandered around the country working, like someone said, on false names and one thing and another to get work and all the rest of it. Now my heart is high because we have a national campaign against it. But we've got to take it further than that. Our industry, the construction industry, is a sick industry. It's so sick that as a skilled engineer like myself, an electrical engineer, and, I, and I've run contracts worth a million pound just on electrics alone, I'm not on about the building side of it, and, and these contracts, they're worth a lot of money and you have to bring them out with a 20% profit in one thing or another. And yet I, I got blacklisted for raising safety issues. This can only be brought to an end by the end of the construction industry taxation scheme. The only scheme in the bloody world, in, in one country, 
where individual uh, construction workers pay 30 quid out of the wage every week to draw the wages from, a, from another subcontracting company. And, and this has got to stop, and it'll only stop, and blacklisting will only stop when we control all the sites and when we control the industries and we do the interviewing who gets a job and who doesn't get a job. Hi, um, yeah, basically, I just want to talk a little bit about Frank's campaign, Frank Moss's campaign, in terms of Crossrail, because I think what Frank has done has been nothing short of heroic in terms of his stand outside of, of Crossrail. I mean, the abuse he's taken from the security guards, the, the blacklisting he's taken, what he's done is he's right. And he's raised the profile of not only blacklisting, but exactly what's going on in Crossrail. I mean, people have touched on it a little bit, but the 18 billion pound of our money that's been spent on Crossrail is being used by blacklisters to enrich themselves further and not allow unions on site. And Dave said that it's about not, not being victims. But I think, in terms of if we can use Crossrail, because in the next couple of years, Crossrail is now going to employ somewhere in the region between four and 8,000 electricians. It's going to be a massive plug of paper onto that site. And unless we... I'm not going to get time already. But, and the, what, uh, to not be victims of the building track, because I mean, during the Bethlehem dispute, a lot of people, a lot of, I've heard a lot of United officials <coughs> who have a lot of history saying how, how hard it is to organise, people weren't interested in joining unions on building sites. And in fact, no one likes to go to work and be treated like a piece of shit, which a lot of building sites is what you are. You're, you're a number, you, you work for an agency, you'll be sacked at moment's notice, you're a piece of shit, don't like it, pal, fuck off, get your gear and fuck off. And that happens on so many sites. And I think we need to take what Frank's doing at Crossrail. And then and wrong with it, because I think there's an opportunity there. It's not should be treated as a victimisation again, it should be treated as an opportunity. Because if we can get on the crossrail and organise, if Frank can get his job back, which they're talking about in terms of Besna, uh, sorry, in terms of United, talking about that, they can, we can start to actually sort of reorganise the industry. Because if we get four, between four and 8,000 electricians on there and other trades who start to unionise, start to organise, it's not only a question of getting Frankie's job back, it's a question of reorganising building sites. And if we get people organised on, on crossrail, our money again, we can actually sort to look to build unions on sites and actually raise with people. You can be a union member and be a building worker. You don't have to be a victim. You can fight back. You can argue for better, better conditions. You don't have to die at work. You can argue for better, better pay. And if we take Crossrail as an opportunity and not as, not as a, a threat, we can actually start to build that. And I think United, if they start to organise around sites and start to recruit, you can push an open door. Because as I said, no one likes to be treated like a piece of shit at work. Building workers want to be organised. I think people want to earn better money. They don't want to be treated like crap. And if we take Crossrail, take Frank's, Frank's example, Frank, Frank Morris back in as convener of the job, reorganise a site, take the elections on there, we can actually start to turn the tide back in terms of organisation and not be victims, but organised building work. I think there is a, an important debate about where, in terms of the escalation and that sort of having gone from the unions being bloody awful and indeed complicit in the blacklist to then moving forward to actually coming on board and how you keep pushing, pushing them. Because the amount of effort the people in this room, I have nothing to do with it, involved over that Besner dispute of pushing people to come on board and stay on board and keep going through is really, really important. Not all leverage is equal, can I dare suggest. And actually pushing through a strategy that can turn the tide is a thing that construction workers need to fucking fight through, argue and think. The real point I want to make really, really quickly, it's a very simple thing, because that thing about fear, because there are two ways of looking at the minute. There's undercover cops in every room where the left meet. The Stephen Lawrence family were spied on. The special branch of all over you. Time and time again, the blacklist, everything about it is miserable and scary because that's what it's meant to be like. There's another way of looking at it at the minute. At the minute, they are fracturing in all sorts of different ways. From Coulson and Brooks coming up in September to the, the cancerous poison in terms of the coalition over Hackgate, which will come back in one shape or form. Various scandals from the killing of Daniel Morgan and other miscarriages. What's happened with the undercover cops in the blacklist shows people in all sorts of different ways the actual way in which the system works, and that's an important lesson for us all to learn. But the other thing this teaches us, and this is the thing that's important, is it shows that they can be beaten. That those long-term justice campaigns that got people out of prison, that overturned judgments, that finally get justice for families and so on and so forth, also can give confidence to people. And that's the process, I think, that's happening with blacklisting. 
partly by linking up to those things, it shouldn't be reduced to just under, undercover cops, but actually that gives you the potential not just to show how rotten the bastards are, but to beat them. Uh, Ian Bradley, I'm a member of New MSWP, also I'm a construction worker myself, I'm not on the uh, blacklist, well not the one that's known, but I'm sure there's probably already blacklists started up elsewhere again. And really, on a, that's the, the thing, when you say how can you beat the blacklist, really, in a way you're not going to beat blacklisting while capitalism exists, because while there's profits to be made, and they want to drive workers' wages down to make their profits extended, there's always going to be some sort of form of blacklisting. Well, actually, what you can do is actually just sort of stop it and sort of uh, calm its effect. And obviously, the way you can do that is obviously all the way through, through, you know, you've got the things like the court system, even though obviously you've got people like Steve Aitchison, not really worked for 10 years. He won a case the other month, he got £12,000. If you're not worth for 10 years, what's 12 grand, you know? If I was a company that's making millions by keeping unions off my site, I'd quite happily give him 12 grand for him to go away. You know, things like that. And it's why we've been smearing through the media and parliamentary route, and we've got this leverage campaign. I'm a, I sort of finished, but really, and a few people have touched on, how are you going to beat it by having organised workplaces, unionised organised workplaces? And this is what we're going to try and do in construction. We've got the, we've got the networks that we've built through the, through the disputes that now we want to put them onto the site where we have well organised sites. And then when people like Steve Majorson apply for a job, if he don't get the job, we'll go and sit in the canteen and their job won't get built until he's actually on there and working. And that's the only really way you're going to beat the blacklist. <laughs> They act, we can actually smash them. I've been, I've been on a few of the uh, uh, demonstrations, and what I found uh, uh, fascinating is this question of confidence. Because on some of them, like, uh, like people haven't felt confident enough to block Oxford Street. Well, if they have, it's only been for about you know 30 seconds, and then because there's been, it happens to have been a, a smaller demo, people pull back or. Uh, but at other times, people have had that confidence to just stay there, that extra, say, 10 seconds, to scare the police out of saying, come on, move over and that. And then they, once they've stayed there, just long enough to, to establish that they own that Oxford Street, basically, then they're there for uh, hours, you know, sometimes. So <coughs> the, the, the confidence, we always say in the Socialist Workers' Party, confidence isn't something that... Uh, uh, if Tony Benn, actually, he always says, uh, when I, confidence is, what, what is it? When I wake up in the morning, am I confident or not? I'm only as confident as that person who I see in the mirror when I shave. Um, in, in other words, you know, it, you can't measure confidence in individuals. It comes out of the collective. Uh, and I think that there's a lesson there about how, how, uh, how all fights are won. <coughs> so, uh, you know, like when, when uh, they occupied, I was with, with the demonstrators when they occupied Grant Brothers, individually, uh, people thought, oh, uh, should we push in? And then accidentally the gates got opened and then one person came in, should I hold it open for someone else? And then, the, so confidence is a collective thing, that's, that's what I'm saying. Um, and um, with regard to uh, fighting and then getting the unions on your side, fighting as individuals here and there, I think, is it Phil? Yeah, Phil should win the Paul Foot Award. There's a, an award for uh, investigative journalism every year. I think Phil should win it. Yeah. Right, Sean from Real News. I think we can safely say Frank's not going to make it today. Um, I think that's probably likely. But I know there's a few things that Frank would have wanted to point out if he had got here. Um, I've been on the picket. I mean, I've, like Dave said, I've been sort of involved in the blacklist support group and the campaign against blacklisting over the last four years. Um, I've been on the picket line across, uh, with Frank on the Crosshill project this week. He's moved to Bond Street. We're probably going to stay at Bond Street. Uh, one, it's loads of people going past there. It's a lovely sunny place as well. Yeah. It's a lovely place to do a picket. But this week's been interesting. When Frank told me Keir, who are the, who are the main people being targeted over the Crosshill thing at the moment, they lost a £200 million contract this week. And what's significant about that, this is not a contract they were tendering for and hoping to get. This is a contract they were already on. Wow. Already on. When it came up to renew the contract, the 
local government, I don't know which local government it was because Frank can't remember, the local government said there are questionable practices about your relations with your employees so we're not going to renew the contract. They have just lost the £200 million contract. BAM and Ferrovial are shitting themselves at the moment. They contacted United this week saying, we've got to talk, we've got to talk. United said back to them, to their credit, we're not talking unless we're talking about the reinstatement of Frank Morris. They said, we still want to come and talk. Yesterday, <coughs> Thursday, sorry, they, they met, they are coming back with some sort of offer next Wednesday. Now, we'll see what that is, but the, 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 the pressure that is coming on these companies now as a result of what Frank has done, and Jim's right, this is absolutely heroic. And let's not forget, Frank did this all on his own for four months without any, any support from the union, really, at all. It was only in January. Frank got sacked in September. They only came in in January with all this stuff. It is starting to turn the tide, but only because Frank and the rank of file of the construction workers got on board and started doing this stuff. And it's exactly the same. In the four years I've been I've been sort of filming what the Blacklist Support Group was doing and all this, the major, the major point when this turned around was the best of dispute. When workers started walking off sites, when oh it's amazing this never got in the news. Five hundred strong mass pickets in the centre of London fighting the police, physically stopping people coming into work, not a single electrician going into work. That is when things started changing. And the key thing about that as well was the United didn't get on board with that for a few months. At the start, they were talking the rank and file with cancer growth. The main thing I'm thinking here is it's rank and file action that does this. Maybe we should start thinking about having a rover of union branches who have got who are active enough to start sending people down to Frank's Pick at the crossroad and building this up. The, the flash mob this week, people were applauding it from the side of the road. People were getting their pictures taken in front of the banners. You know, <laughs> if we could turn this 40 into 400 people, think what that would do. And I think we should really seriously start, start thinking in terms of this is an issue for the entire trade union movement. So those branches that we got that are active, that got active members, we should start having a road to so people are going down to support Frank every fucking week. <laughs> Hands up, but it is actually half past eight, and we're meant to finish at half past eight. Um, and I want to give Dave and Phil at least uh, uh, some opportunity to uh, to respond. Yeah. Uh, Dave, if I just follow on, actually, I thought um, I want to follow on from what James said about um, about no one wants to be treated like rubbish at work. The thing that I found most extraordinary about having Frank as a client. Because you know we know how they're going to attack him when it comes to his case. and say the you know the employers could have had this information. It didn't have to come from their, their side. It could have come from within. It may be because you were such a, a militant union activist even before you become a branch secretary or whatever. Maybe you talked to lots of other people in the workplace. So we've had to quiz Frank. I mean, and people said Frank hasn't always got the best memory. You know, we've had to. There've been eight or nine times we sat down for a couple of hours time to work out get absolutely every detail about what happened. The thing I find extraordinary is that, that this rank and file network of builders has been sustained by people like Frank. And you listen to Frank's history. Ten years he was a trade union member without ever being a shop steward. There are many of us who used to say, you know, public sector, white collar unions, whatever, where it's very easy. Any time in your workplace, if you want things to be organised, you know you can have recognition. You know you can have meetings. How on earth are people sustaining that memory of culture of trade unionism in the sorts of circumstances where you aren't used to it? But they are sustaining it. And when people have said if we could, if Crossrail did get organised, if trade unionism, the sorts of trade unionism we want to see being generalised, i.e. meetings, properly elected people, etc, etc, etc. If that sort of experience has become, become the norm for four, five, eight thousand people in the middle of London, I totally agree. That would be a, a movement of people to have some real, real power. Yeah, there was, a, there was a period, I think, just after, about, after 2010, after the regulations finally came in, where um, uh, it felt like uh, they'd done enough to kind of quell the kind of issue. They kind of brushed it under the carpet. Um, and I would keep tabs on the kind of uh, various issues they came up and uh, be able to kind of see where uh, people were talking about the issue or where extra information was coming up. And it was, you know, maybe once once a month you'd get something or you'd see some other maybe piece of research be done or uh, someone would talk and have a story, you'd get a file, some of file would come through. Um, now, I can't keep up. Across the country, 
it, it's not being directed from the centrally. The stuff's happening, like emerging across the country, across Europe. Like I'm, I'm looking on the phone and getting something come through from Scandinavia. People are demonstrating outside our place in Scandinavia. And it was incredible within the last two years, really, about how this has sprung up. <clears throat> and from, from below. And if you were looking from the point of view of um, corporation, if you were Calpines or Kia, the same way that you would monitor and kind of think about, you know, where is it occurring, they're the same way they're thinking. They, don't know, they, they must be shitting themselves about what's going to come up next. They've got no idea about what's popping up, what different things are going on, being sorted on all different sides. So I think actually this has got a long, long way to go. And I think what's really interesting is how far and how fast and how well it's come on so far. So I think actually think that in the last few years about how much has been achieved uh, in such a short space of time and actually how much more is likely to be achieved as well. And I look forward to kind of writing about that. Thank you very much for attending people. Um, I hope it's been of uh, some use. A um, few people said uh, some very, very interesting stuff. Um, is there more than one blacklist? There's more than one blacklist in the construction industry. You know, it's the truth. We've got the Consultant Association one. There's another one that was exposed in the Select Committee. The, the woman's name was Sheila Noet. She was the Deputy Director of ACAS. <laughs> After she left ACAS, she went and worked for Drake and Skulls as the head of industrial relations for Drake and Skulls when they built the Jubilee line. And when that finished, her first job when that finished was circulating the names of every electrician who worked on the Jubilee line to all of the other uh, industrial relations officers to work as another separate blacklist. Yeah. So, so if, if ACAS are involved in blacklisting us then in the building industry, then I'm absolutely certain it is happening in the North Sea, that it's happening in the public sector, the whistleblowers in the health service are suffering it, and you know, education and engineering, it's happening all over. But the thing is, this is not about being a victim. There was a massive dispute in the construction industry two or three years ago, if I'm trying to remember how long ago it was, I think that was about 18 months ago, uh, it was the Sparks dispute, Besna. When it came in, the employers wanted to withdraw from the national agreement and cut electricians' pay by 35%. When it first happened, the union was like shell-shocked. The union didn't know what to do, the national union really didn't have a strategy, and the rank and file organised it. They had meetings of 500. The rank and file were the people who put 500 people outside Blackfriars Station when they were building it at six o'clock in the morning, and we had running battles with the police. Now, forget the minor strike, there's been running battles with the police in London. You know, 18 months ago it was happening on picket lines. And if we had a great, famous victory on Besna, and I tell you what, we are going to have a very, very famous victory on Crossrail. And if you've ever been on them protests, where have you been? Get yourself down to the Crossrail protest, because this is going to be one that they write about in years to come, and we are going to have a party like bloody Glastonbury when that happens. Thank you very much.